In this video, we will be covering plant energetics and also the Calvin cycle. So when I took this class um, about two months ago, we went over a couple of lectures talking about plants. So if your professor doesn't talk about plants, you can skip this video. So let's begin. Within the plant, we have the chloroplast. So this is actually called a chloroplast. Now within the chloroplast, there is DNA. It's one of the few parts of the plant that has its own genome. Because again, chloroplast could have came from um, an aerobic uh, organism via the en endosymbiotic theory. So again, this has its own genome and it's kind of separate from the plant. Now chloroplast, they act, they act just like the mitochondria. Mito. meaning that it produces energy for the plant. How does it do it? So instead of having mitochondria, the chloroplast has these little stacks of pancakes, and these pancakes together are called a granum. So this is called a granum. Okay. Now, separately, separately, these discs called pancakes, these are actually thylakoids. So this little circle right there is called a thylakoid. thylakoid. And whenever these are stacked together, they make a granum. Now within the thylakoid, you have this weird structure. So here is going to be the stroma, which is kind of like this area that is outside. The stroma is similar to the matrix, meaning that it's kind of like jelly. It's like the outside ocean. Now the stroma is going to be outside of the thylakoids. Inside the thylakoid is where you start making energy. So inside the thylakoid we have some hydrogens and these hydrogens are going to go out and they're going to produce energy. Within the thylakoid membrane we have the items that make ATP and energy. So the thylakoid membrane is kind of serving as the intermembrane. right? So the thylakoid membrane is acting like the inner membrane. So we have the inner inner membrane. And we produce energy and the energy is going to be holed up on the uh, inner membrane. So this is very similar to the mitochondria. Okay? So the outside is the stroma, the thylakoid membrane is the inner membrane, and the granum is just kind of like a collection of thylakoids. And we are going to be looking at the process in which this creates ATP and uses a, a proton gradient, like the mitochondria. Now, in order for chloroplasts to capture energy from the from light, we need to have a special molecule, and the special molecule is called a chloro chlorophyll, right? So this is called a chlorophyll. I don't know who names these stuff, it's, it's ridiculous. But what this is, is essentially, it's, it is a porphyrin, porphyrin head. Now you'd be surprised of how many times porphyrin comes up on biology. It's ridiculous how many times it comes up. But it is a complex ring, ring structure. And really, if you want to look at its uh, structure, you would classify it as a cyclic tetra, pyrrole, a cyclic tetrapyrrole. Now this means that we have four nitrogen, we have four nitrogen pyrrole rings, and then we will have a magnesium ion, and that's going to be chelated with uh, the nitrogens. So we have the magnesium ion, and whenever I say chelate, it just means that multiple bonds are connected to this ion. It's kind of like an ionic bond. So we have multiple chelates to magnesium, right? And um, I guess you could classify this as a coordinate bond, which is a coordinate, coordinate, covalent bond. Uh, coordinate covalent bond means that all the ions that make this bond come from one atom. Normally, when you have two atoms, they both share 
electrons to make this bond. But with the coordinate covalent bond, this one is ionic, and this one is not ionic, so it uses its electrons to create a bond. So one atom gives up all its electrons to make that bond, and this is called a coordinate covalent bond. Now notice that the MCAT will throw you a question that says, oh, this type of bond is a coordinate covalent, um, sorry, co coordinate ionic bond. And you're like, okay, well, you know, magnesium and, and nitrogen, yeah, those are ionic because magnesium is ionic, so it has to be coordinate ionic. But that would be incorrect. That does not exist. The only coordinate bond that exists would have to be the coordinate covalent bond. So again, coordinate covalent bonds are just when the electrons from one atom make up the bond and the ion does not contribute to that bond. Okay, so over here, this head, we'll call it the head, that is gonna be transformed whenever it gains electrons from the light. So this is where the electron transition occurs, right? So when we add an electron, this is going to be uh, be transformed and it can shift configurations to transfer electrons and then it's going to have a long hydrophobic tail so this is a hydrocarbon tail so this is hydro hydrocarbon tail and that allows us to be hydrophobic since this molecule is a largely hydrophobic it's going to be found in the membrane so this is found found in the membrane and the membrane okay so let's kind of clear the board now what kind of light can this chlorophyll absorb normally it absorbs absorbs blue and red light blue and red light okay so as you can possibly see, it absorbs in about, let's say 470, 470 nanometers of wavelength. And it also absorbs in the 600 range. So let's just talk about physics for a bit. I don't know what this course is. It's like a mixture of physics, mathematics, and chemistry. It's, nah. Anyways, when we go to a smaller wavelength, we actually gain energy. So this is a gain of energy. And whenever we go to the shorter wavelengths, or I guess the longer wavelengths, we actually decrease energy. And so what chlorophyll can do is that it can absorb high energy and it can also absorb low energy. So that's pretty interesting actually. But where does that light go? Where does it go inside the chlorophyll? Hmm. Well, I can show you where the light goes in the chloroplast, and we're going to find out right now. Within the chloroplast, you have something called a photosystem. So what is a photosystem? A photosystem is kind of like a little section of the chloroplast that allows energy to transfer. So now a photosystem has two parts to it. It has the antenna, and it also has the reaction center. So what does the antenna do? So the antenna is a site. So antenna is a site of energy transfer. So let's, let's write that better. So it is the site of energy transfer. And what about the reaction center? So the reaction center is the site for electron transfer, for electron, electron transfer. So the chlorophyll within the plants, the, the molecule that I showed you, really the chlorophyll is gonna be found inside the antenna. And so the antenna, the antenna which has energy transfer, has a majority, has really all of the, the chlorophyll pigments. So we have the chlorophyll pigments. Because again, these chlorophyll pigments can actually transfer, they can transfer electrons, and electrons are, is what contains the energy for the, the uh, chloroplast. Right, so antennas collect light and they transfer 
the excitation energy to the reaction center complex. So notice that this is kind of like a little taxi where the energy from the light can be absorbed into the chlorophyll pig, uh, pigments and they can transfer the chlorophyll pigments to each other. So what I'm saying is the electrons go into the antenna and then the chlorophyll pigments absorbs the electrons and it transfers the electrons to the other chlorophyll pigments and eventually these electrons reach the reaction center and here we can actually create energy from the light. Now let's talk about the reaction center. So in the reaction center we received a chlorophyll dimer from the antennas. So this uh, red blocks right here, these red blocks, these are actually chlorophyll, chlorophyll dimers. Now di means two. So what I'm saying is whenever you have one chlorophyll and you connect it with another chlorophyll, they make a dimer. So that is just two chlorophyll molecules together. Now when these two chlorophyll molecules go inside the reaction center, they actually transfer a um, high energy electron. So these guys transfer a high energy electron that can go on to spark more reactions. And that reaction can create energy for the plant. So this reaction center over here is what creates the energy. So we have the transfer of a high energy electron from the dimer and that's gonna cause a separation. Now when that separation has occurred, the electron can move and it can go into the uh, electron transport chain, right? So the carrier passes high energy electron to the transport chain. Now the transport chain is a bit different from the mitochondrial electron transport chain. We still have ATP synthase, but the way we make energy is a lot different. So within the chloroplast, we will have photosystems and photosystems use the electron created from the reaction center to drive a uh, energy making process. So in the photosystem too, because there are two photosystems, this is going to be the second one, photosystem two, we will call that the PS2, right, copyrighted or whatever. So over here, the electron in PS2 is going to be transferred to plastoquinone. Now plastoquinone is a membrane bound electron carrier. So this is a membrane, this is a membrane bound electron carrier. So E carrier. It's like a taxi. So when this electron needs to go into a different part of the thylakoid membrane, so everything is occurring in the thylakoid membrane, remember that the thylakoid membrane is kind of like the inner membrane. Inner membrane and that the intermembrane that's going to be called the lumen this is called the lumen right the lumen of the thylakoid space so what happens here is that when an electron is transferred into the plastoquinone which serves as a taxi the electron is going to be transferred into a into a photosynthetic proton pump so this proton pump is going to create a pump that kind of, I know I'm using pump a lot, but it's going to pump these hydrogens into the thylakoid space. And it does that by using the energy from this electron. So let's clear everything up. So again, this electron, which is created by these chlorophyll dimers in the reaction center, is going to be transferred into the plastoquinone. And this plastoquinone is going to transfer this energy to the um, photosynthetic pump and is going to pump these hydrogens into the thylakoid space. Now whenever we have a pumping of hydrogens, this is going to be called a proton gradient. This proton gradient. And remember that since we have a high concentration of protons, the pH is going to be very low. Because a low pH, like a pH of 3, means that you have a lot of hydrogens. Therefore the pH inside the stroma would be higher. So let's say that the pH would have to be, I don't know, like a, a 7. So a pH of 3 in the thylakoid space because there's more hydrogens, and a pH of 7 in the stroma, I'm just making these numbers up by the way, because the pH would have to be uh, higher because the hydrogen concentration is lower, okay? Because pH is just a measure of how much hydrogens you have. 
Now, because we have a high pH, or um, excuse me, since we have a high hydrogen concentration, the hydrogens want to go down the concentration. So they want to go from a high concentration to a low concentration of hydrogens. Now, when that happens, the high uh, hydrogens, they go down into the ATP synthase. So this is ATP synthase. And what it does is that it uses the concentration of hydrogens to create energy. It creates ATP from ADP and a phosphate ion. So this is phosphoric acid right here, the PI. And what happens here is that the ADP comes in contact with the ATP synthase. It uses the hydrogens to turn the mechanism and it creates energy. And it creates energy from the photosystem too. And so we can say that photosystem 2 is involved in creating ATP. So we could say photosystem 2 creates ATP. Now we have another photosystem, and this is going to be called photo, photo system, system 1. So this is a PS1. And like the PS1, it's not as powerful as the PS2. So more people had the PS2 than the PS1. That's how I remember it. The PS2 has more energy. It creates energy. The PS1 doesn't create energy. So this is no, no ATP, ATP made. Instead, we are going to make, we are going to make NADPH. So notice that we have an additional phosphate right here. So NADPH is kind of like a product of this reaction. You also may have seen this from the uh, pentose phosphate pathway, where we make NADPH from G6P and some other stuff. But here, we're not really making that. Over here, we're making NADPH from uh, electrons. So what happens here is that the late activates the chlorophyll dimer within the reaction center, and this electron is going to be transferred into ferrodoxin. So notice that in PS2 we were using the plastoquinone, but now we're using the ferrodoxin. And of course this is again membrane bound. This is a membrane, membrane bound electron carrier. Now ferrodoxin is going to be acting like a, a taxi for this electron, and it's going to shift this electron into this ferrodoxin NADP reductase. And what that enzyme does is that it is going to reduce, it is going to reduce the NADP plus with an electron. And that electron is really going to come from this hydrogen. So it's, it's weird to think of a hydrogen as an electron because electrons are negatively charged and hydrogens are positively charged. But the reaction over here it's really complicated, but what happens here is that the proton right here is going to act as an electron, and it's going to attach itself to the NADP. And when it does, it's going to create NADPH. And this NADPH can be used to create more energy, as you'll later see in the video. So again, the PS1, the photosystem one, does not create ATP. It doesn't have an ATP synthase. Instead, it has ferrodoxin NADP reductase. Now, of course, reduction is when you add hydrogens, right? So, or, or, or when you gain electrons. So, of course, this is going to be a reduction. So, PS system, the photosystem one, is going to reduce, re reduces NAD, let's write that better, NADP into NADPH. So, it reduces NADP plus to NADPH. So let's go back to talking about the photosystem 2. So this is PS2. Now in PS2, you're going to be using water, right? So light can hit the reaction center, but we can also have water reacting with it. So when, whenever water is going to be split into oxygen and some protons, this is going to be establishing the proton gradient. So this helps in creating the proton gradient. But also, Whenever this water splits, we create an electron. And that electron can be paired with the chlorophyll dimer, as you see here. And that electron can be transferred between the uh, chlorophyll heads. And then it can be transferred to plastoquinone. And so water also creates, also creates the electron. We get an electron from light too, right? 
And so oxygen is generated by a water splitting enzyme associated with PS2. So we have this little enzyme and it splits water. So now we have oxygen, which we breathe in from the plants. And we also have this proton gradient that is being created. So we get electrons from light and we also get some um, electrons from the water. So we have two electron sources, two sources for E. And that is the light and also water. And from the water, we get oxygen and some protons. And eventually, these uh, electrons from both sources are transferred to plastoquinone. So what happens if we combine these two photosystems? If we combine PS1 and PS2, what do we get? It turns out that we get the non-cyclic we get the non-cyclic photophosphorylation. It's a lot of letters, which is ridiculous. But again, what happens here is that the light is going to activate the antenna complex. The antenna complex is going to have chlorophylls. These chlorophylls are going to transfer electrons. The electrons are going to form, well, the chlorophyll dimers are formed within the reaction center. On top of the reaction center, you have a an enzyme, and the enzyme is going to split some water. When the water splits using this enzyme on top of the reaction center, it's going to create oxygen, and it's also going to create protons. And this happens in the lumen. Now, these protons accumulate, okay? But the electron created from this reaction of splitting water is also transferred within the uh, reaction center. Now the electrons in the reaction center are transferred to plastoquinone. The plastoquinone is acting like a taxi. So it transfers the electrons from the reaction center and it's going to transfer it to cytochrome B6F complex. Now cytochrome B6X complex, it just transfers protons into the lumen. So the protons from the stromium, they go to the lumen and it uses the energy from the electrons to transfer hydrogens. So now we're establishing a proton gradient. And now these proton gradients, they want to go from a high concentration to a low concentration. And so what happens here is that these protons are going to be creating uh, ATP. So we go from a high concentration of protons to a low concentration of protons. And that creates ATP. So now the plant has energy to survive. But what happens to the electron in the cytochrome B6X, uh, B6F complex? What happens to that electron? Well, it turns out that this electron is transferred to another taxi, and this taxi is called plastocyanin. So plastocyanin can travel outside of the membrane. So plastocyanin transfers an electron, it transfers an electron to another reaction center. And this reaction center is actually part of the photosystem one complex. So this reaction center receives an electron from the plastocyanin, and now we're working with an electron right here. So this electron is going to transfer itself to the chlorophyll dimers. These dimers are going to transfer this electron to this ferrodoxin. It's pretty cool. So this ferrodoxin, again, is acting like a taxi. So now this electron is going to transfer to ferrodoxin, and then it's going to transfer itself to the ferrodoxin NADP reductase. It uses this electron to convert or to reduce NADP plus into NADPH. And this NADPH can be used for other reactions. And so notice that we kind of use one electron to create energy. And we used one electron to create NADPH. So this was like the same electron. So whether you got this electron from the enzyme splitting the water, or whether you got this from the light, you use that exact same electron to create NADPH and also to create energy. And so the plant is super, super efficient in creating energy and also NADPH from just one electron. It's absolutely ridiculous. It's super efficient and it's really cool. So now you can see how everything kind of accumulates into one uh, magnificent and efficient uh, reaction system. So this is a combination of the PS1 system and the PS2 system. And again, this is going to be called the non-cyclic photo photophosphorylation system, in which we create NADPH and also ATP. But what happens 
what happens if we don't want to make any DPH? Well, if I don't want to make any DPH and I only want to make ATP, then really what we're going to be using is a PS2, right? Because the PS2, that's going to be making ATP synthase. PS1 makes NADPH. So how do we ignore NADPH? Well, now we're going to be talking about the cyclic, the cyclic photo phosphorylation, phosphorylation. And this one essentially uses the PS2 system. So that's really just a PS2 by itself. So again, what happens here is that the water splits, it generates electrons. The electron hits the reaction center, it also generates electrons. These electrons are going to be transferred from the chlorophyll dimer. Now they're going to be transferred to the plastoquinone, which is acting like a taxi for the electrons. The electrons are going to power the cytochrome B6F complex, and that cytochrome B6F uh, complex is going to pump uh, hydrogens from a low concentration into a high concentration. And now these hydrogens are going to create ATP synthase because they go from a high concentration to a low concentration, and that creates ATP. But what happens to the electron over here? Doesn't it want to shift? Well, it does want to leave. Obviously, it wants to leave the, uh, the complex, and so it's going to transfer itself to plastocyanin. Now, normally in the non-cyclic photophosphorylation, the, uh, the plastocyanin transfers it to ferredoxin, and the ferredoxin transfers it to the reductase. But here, in the cyclic phosphorylation, the electron is going to be transferred to ferredoxin, but instead of going to reductase, ferredoxin transfers it all the way back to plastoquinone. And so that is the main difference, that ferredoxin within the cyclic photophosphorylation transfers the electron back into plas uh, plastoquinone. And so this electron that you see here will continue to cycle and cycle and cycle forever. You know, so that is going to be the electron that just keeps going and going. And so here, if the plant just wanted to make ATP and it didn't, it didn't have that many electrons and it needed energy, it would undergo the cyclic phosphorylation cycle. Okay, so this is a cycle, that's why it's called cyclic, and we are reusing the same electron. So this is, again, very efficient and very cool. So that is how you make ATP using one electron, and that is if you don't need any DPH. So this is not being created. We ignore it, the ferredoxin electron goes back to the pl plastoquinone. So now we have some ATP that we made, and we also have some NADPH that we made. What do we do with that? I mean, it doesn't really make sense why we're making NADPH. I understand why we're making ATP, but why do we care about NADPH? Well, that actually will be transferred into the dark reactions. So the dark reactions is not some sort of witchcraft or a cult or whatever. It's actually just um, an, a way of making energy without light. So what I've showed you before in the last 26 minutes or so was energy being created with light. And so we call those the light reactions because we're making energy with light and we're producing oxygen. Now what happens here is that we are going to be creating energy from darkness. So we're going to be creating more energy from ATP and creating more energy from NADPH. And this is called the carbon fixation cycle. Some people call it the Calvin cycle. I, thought, I, I think it sounds cooler if you call it the Calvin cycle. But we're going to be using carbon dioxide from the outside, and we're going to be creating energy from this carbon dioxide. So this is why whenever you own plants, uh, you breathe on them so they have more nutrients. And if you ever wondered why we breathe on them, it's because we produce carbon dioxide. And the plants can actually fix the carbon dioxide from our, from our breaths, and they can create energy. Uh, via sugars, amino acids, and uh, fatty acids. So actually, they can create fat from your uh, carbon dioxide. So I think that's pretty cool, okay? So now we're gonna be looking at the dark reactions of how it creates energy without light. Now, what we have to do is we have to get carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is gonna be combined with ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And ribulose 1,5 bisphosphate is a 5 carbon. It is a 5 carbon, 5 carbon uh, sugar. And that is the primary, it is the primary, primary carbon dioxide acceptor. So notice what are we going to form? 
we have five carbons over here, but our products are gonna have three carbons and another three carbons. So where am I gonna get this extra carbon? Because to, together they make six carbons. So where am I gonna get that? Well, I get the additional carbon from carbon dioxide. That is why we're using ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate because it's gonna accept this carbon dioxide and then it's gonna split, it's gonna split somewhere and we are gonna create some products. So how do we split this molecule? Because really we have an intermediate, right? We have an intermediate of one, two, three, four, five, and six. Well, I wanna split you open, but how do I do that? Well, I'm gonna use Rubisco, okay? So Rubisco, to even do this reaction, is going to kinda of combine and then it's gonna reduce, it's gonna reduce carbon dioxide. And so really, if we want to classify Rubisco, if you want to name it, this is called ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, and it's called carboxylase, carboxylase, carboxylase oxygenase, oxygenase, okay? So uh, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, I don't know who names this, don't, don't get mad at me, please don't we call it Rubisco. So Rubisco is going to catalyze this reaction, this addition of carbon dioxide into ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. This creates an intermediate, and then we're going to use water to split open this molecule. And whenever this molecule splits open, we create two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. So 3-phosphoglycerate is a 3-carbon acid. So this is a 3-carbon three 3-carbon three acid and it is the first stable product of photosynthesis. So this is the first, first stable product of photosynthesis, of photosynth, right? But in order to do the Calvin cycle, we need six molecules. So if I get two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate per carbon dioxide, then how many molecules of carbon dioxide do I need to make six? Well, that's right, I need three carbon dioxides. So I need three carbon dioxides. Let's just write it over here. I need three carbon dioxides to make six molecules of, of three phosphoglycerate. Now, before I leave this slide, you have to know that carbon dioxide has four bonds to oxygen. So this carbon right here has four bonds to oxygen. But notice over here, notice that we lose so many bonds to oxygen. So we have less bonds. So we have less bonds to oxygen. What does that mean? Well, it means that we were reduced. And so re reduction means that you have a decrease in bonds attached to oxygen. So this is a reduction. So this was a reduction. So carbon dioxide is reduced into 3-phosphoglycerate. So carbon dioxide is reduced to 3-phosphoglycerate. And this is the Calvin cycle zoomed out. In the beginning, we had one molecule of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. We need to introduce three carbon dioxides and three waters. Now, whenever carbon dioxide reacts with uh, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, it creates two molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. So since I have three carbon dioxides and I make two molecules, I get six molecules of 3-PG. Now, I have to reduce the six molecules of 3-phosphoglycerate. And when I reduce it, I'm gonna be using ATP and I'm gonna be using NADPH. So I use one ATP and one NADPH for every, for every uh, molecule of 3-phosphoglycerate. Therefore, I need six ATP and I need six NADPH. Now, whenever this occurs, we reduced six 3-phosphoglycerates and therefore we create, we create six molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So we create six molecules 
of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. So this is G3P. And this is what we're going to be using for energy. So this can be created for uh, starch, sucrose, sugars, etc. I mean, it pretty, it's pretty cool, actually. But what if I need to regenerate ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate? Because without ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, this reaction doesn't occur. And so I have to do a regeneration reaction. And what happens here is that one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is going to leave the area. It's going to leave the area and it's going to become sugar and, and starch. And so now I have five molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Now ATP is going to react with the five molecules of G3P, right? So sorry, G3P. So whenever this happens, it's going to regenerate ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And so really, we did all of this work to create one molecule, to create one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And that is what the Calvin cycle does. It converts carbon dioxide and it reduces it into a sugar called uh, glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Now, the other glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates become ribulose 1 5 bisphosphate via the regeneration cycle. And so we have three sections we have the carboxylation, we have the reduction, and we have the regeneration. So the carboxylation fixes the carbon dioxide into uh, 3 phosphoglycerate. The reduction converts th uh, three phosphoglycerates into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and the regeneration section converts glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate back into ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. And so if you want to kind of keep count, for every three molecules, for every three molecules of carbon dioxide that enters the Calvin cycle, we will produce, we will produce one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, and we will use up, we will consume, we will consume nine molecules of ATP. So we're going to consume nine molecules of ATP and also six molecules of NADPH. So again, three molecules of carbon dioxide and also three waters will go into the Calvin cycle. We only create one glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And we use up nine molecules of ATP and six molecules of NADPH. So that's the Calvin cycle. And notice that this is a three-carbon sugar. If I want to make glucose, which is a six-carbon sugar, then how much ATP do I need? How much NADPH do I need? Well, if this makes a three carbon sugar and I need a six carbon sugar, then automatically I need 18 ATP and 12 NADPH to make glucose. If you want to look at it per turn, I use up two molecule, two molecules of NADPH. and also three molecules of ATP, and that is per turn of the Calvin cycle. And what does that tell you about the cycle? Well, it tells you that we have to go three times in this Calvin cycle to create a product, because every time I, I, um, every time I go through this cycle, I add one carbon. So this is the first cycle, this is the second cycle, and this is going to be the third cycle. On the third cycle, we get glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and we use up 9 ATP and 6 NADPH. So we have 3 ATP, uh, 6 ATP, and then we will have 9 ATP. And each time we have 2 NADPH, 4 NADPH, and then finally 6 NADPH. And in the end, we get one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, so one cycle adds to the sugar one carbon. If I want to go six cycles, then I'm going to have glucose, and I'm going to be using 18 ATP and 12 NADPH. And now we're going to be talking about, very briefly, the uses of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So whenever one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate leaves the system, where does it go? It actually goes to the stroma. 
So the stroma is kind of like the plant matrix. This is like the plant matrix, right? And whenever that happens, it can be converted into starch or uh, sucrose, right? So that's how it can create energy. But what if we need more energy? Well, it can be transported into the cytoplasm and it can be converted, can be converted into, into, into pyruvate, right? And it goes into pyruvate via glycolysis. Right. So the splitting of sugars, this is sugar, we can split it. And when we split it, it can be converted into pyruvate. And pyruvate can then enter the citric acid cycle for the plant. And that citric, that citric acid cycle can create more energy and it becomes very efficient. So this can go into the citric acid cycle. And that is the end of the Calvin cycle and the end of this lecture. So I hope that you understand everything that I said to you and you learned about photosystems, energy transport, Rubisco, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, and all that jazz. So I hope that you have a great day and remember that you are special and that I love you. So thank you so much for watching this video and I hope that you have a great day. Thank you and I love you.